Yeah, thank you for the invitation to speak today. And, and um, thank you everyone for uh, coming along. It's uh, preparing for political change. It's, it's quite a febrile moment in, in uh, UK politics at the moment for obvious reasons. And, I, and I, I'm sure that, you know, the, the interest in, in the kind of topic is, uh, is, is, is because of that. We've got a general election which will be coming up sometime this year, we think. Uh, at the latest January next year. I don't think it will be then. I think it will be probably in the autumn. Um, if you're looking for a change of government, I think it's probably quite an anxious time as you nervously watch uh, political developments as they unfold day by day, uh, including significant uh, announcements today, for example. Um, the focus for today's lecture is on the relationship between the venture sector and the Labour Party. The Labour Party has a government in waiting um, so I'm going to try and take stock of that relationship and maybe then begin to look ahead as well. So I'm going to talk for about 30, 35 minutes, maybe a bit, bit more. And then there's space for kind of questions and discussion. I'd be really interested to hear your perspectives and thoughts. Uh, uh, please do put questions and observations um, in the chat. I move my slides forward. They seem to have stuck already. There we go. So we know that successive governments have come to rely heavily on the voluntary sector um, and they often find moments to wax lyrical about it. Uh, so here are the leaders of the two main parties in the UK offering some warm words about what the sector maybe embodies and what it can do. Uh, so, for example, Rishi Sunak in April 2020. So this is right at the beginning of the pandemic. You may remember it. He was Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time. He was just announcing a big financial package for the sector during uh, the pandemic. At this time, when many are hurting and tired and confined, we need the gentleness of things in our lives. It gives us hope, it makes us stronger, and it reminds us we depend on each other. So an interesting take on the role of charities as he sees it. It's about gentleness. Um, and then just in the last couple of weeks, uh, Keir Starmer has made, uh, given some words on the sector as well. He talks about civil society. Um, and here, there's everywhere I go, I hear stories of courage, compassion and community. A future Labour government would work with civil society for a society of service, his chosen words there. A once in a generation chance, a mission led government, a partnership between government and civil society. So on the face of it, it seems to quite like charities and civil society. Um, in practice, the sector doesn't often usually feature that much in electoral competition, at least not explicitly. Uh, mostly it's a relatively kind of consensual zone between the parties. Um, although uh, we might think differently in the last couple of years, how particularly how culture war issues have, uh, have come to the fore, it may be that there's more of a prominence for the sector um, in the forthcoming election. We'll see what happens, obviously, and people will watch that um, with some nervousness, I think. The basic proposition that, that I'm starting with in my, in my lecture is that the Labour Party looks like it's going to win the next election. So it's increasingly looking like um, a government in waiting. And I want to ask questions about what that means for the sector. Uh, the graph shows uh, voting intention in the poll of polls. It's, um, you know, all of the opinions have been sort of uh, a moving average of these. They, this comes from the Politico's website. It's a good website, lots of uh, information on there, um, showing polls, voting intention uh, for the two main parties um, uh, over the last sort of couple of years. Um, so if you scroll back to December 2021, this was the point at which the, the polls changed a little bit. Labour began to take a lead. Um, if you try to remember back what was going on there, I had to look back and just to think of this as well. Um, we had Omicron was uh, the key thing that was a talking point at the time. Labour had just carried out a reshuffle. Um, but crucially, at the end of November, 30th of November, um, the Partygate story began to break in the media. Um, and it was in the weeks and months following that that uh, Boris Johnson's uh, leadership began to unravel quite, uh, quite dramatically. Labour began to uh, gain a lead in the polls and they sustained that lead. The second point in the middle there, where there's a sudden rise in Labour's fortunes and a dip in Conservative fortunes, October 2022, a 30-point lead opens up. Uh, this is known as the Liz Truss Interregnum, um, 44 days or whatever it was that she was 
prime minister. Uh, a poll lead opens up there. It narrows a little bit when Rishi Sunak becomes prime minister shortly afterwards. Um, but actually, it hasn't changed much since. And so we've got around about a 20 point poll lead for Labour as of uh, a couple of days ago. Not much has changed in the in the last uh, year or so. Uh, the expectation is the polls might narrow as we get nearer to the election um, uh, in any case. But it still looks like uh, Labour will be on course to form the, the, the next government. Um, leaving aside polls, you can often tell you know, what's going on by reading the runes. The number of Conservative MPs that are deciding not to stand again uh, is perhaps an indicator of their own thoughts about their prospects. Given that, given the idea that Labour might form the next government, you'd imagine that there would be plenty of policy conversation um, and development um, on and with the voluntary sector. It'd be well underway. Um, and my question that I'm, I've been posing over the last uh, six months or so is, is it is it underway? Is there much policy conversation going on? And if there isn't, uh, why not? What's going on? What, how, what, what's, what, how do we explain this? And what might this mean for the status and position um, of the voluntary sector? I have a bit of a hunch that there was not much going on. This was a hunch that, that came really from uh, following the developments, the contextual developments for the sector policy context uh, over some time. But then hearing conversation at the launch of the Law Family um, Commission on Civil Society, this was in January 2023, I was asking people, is there much conversation with Labour? And people were saying, no, there isn't. There's not much going on at all. So I tried to do a short, rather intense research project in the second half of last year, um, uh, just to try and uh, explore this a bit further. As you'll see, things have moved on quite quickly since then. Um, but I'll kind of, I'm going to talk through some of the kind of key issues that were there. A quick note on terminology. I'm going to use the term voluntary sector for the time being. It's not ideal. I'm using it just for pragmatic reasons. All kinds of terminologies are possible. Uh, they do matter, actually, terminology. And I do. I tend to take a rather broad brush in encompassing definition of the sector. But for the purposes of the presentation, I'm just referring to the voluntary sector for the time being. But I, I, I take that to include community organisations, grassroots groups, social enterprise, uh, the whole gamut. OK, so to set this in a bit of historical context, the, the argument that I'm making, um, I looked back and I thought, well, hang on, let's look at two periods uh, recently where there was a change of government and where actually the opposition leading up to that change of government was in quite a strong position. It looked like a government in waiting. It really looked like the incumbent government wasn't going to uh, survive, was going to lose the, the election. So the two periods I looked at was the lead in to the 1997 uh, Labour landslide, Tony Blair, Blair becoming prime minister in, uh, in 1997. And then the point at which David Cameron becomes prime minister in 2010, the lead into that election, obviously it was, it was inconclusive and a coalition government was formed, but it was a, uh, uh, led to the period of conservative uh, domination uh, since 2010. Now, my key argument here is that in the two to three years prior to those elections in 1997 and 2010, there was a lot of policy development. It was explicit, it was high profile, it was significant. Uh, going on between the opposition and the voluntary sector at the time in different configurations for different reasons. But prior to 97, uh, there was the Deakin report from 96. It was a, a, a year, two year commission before then trying to understand what could be the role of uh, the voluntary sector. It was formulated with an eye to a possible future Labour government. It coincided with Labour uh, formulating its own policy proposals they coincided well. There was lots of coordination and conversation going on that materially affected the policy programme that took place from May 1997. Similarly, before 2010, the Conservative Party, as part of its sort of modernisation strategy, detoxification, uh, was doing lots of work thinking about the role of the third sector, as it was calling it at the time, uh, uh, commissioned reports from the Social Justice Policy Group, uh, and then a green paper from the Conservative Party. This leads into the big society, lots of policy proposals, and that then materially affects the policy programme that takes place from May 2010. So my question is, what's happening now? Is it of a comparable nature? This gives force to the questions about what, what's going on now. And also, 
actually, what, how is the current context different to how it might have been leading into 97 um, and 2010? I've pitched in here the, the election date likely to be October, November. There's been some speculation about May. Oh, I'm not sure. I think it's likely to be autumn still. Uh, there's been some recent speculation that it might be sort of late September, uh, around about what the time of the party conference season, uh, possibly October. So that's where we're sort of looking in terms of the timing. Before talking about the research that I was doing uh, with you, I just wanted to make a couple of words around concepts and relevant literature that's been helped. I'm an academic, I kind of work with the kind of uh, literatures that might be helpful in terms of informing and explaining uh, uh, some of the things that I'm researching. Um, actually, there's been quite a lot written, as you probably know, about the voluntary sector's relationship with the state and perhaps less so, but its engagement in politics more generally. So there's a big literature on that. Lots written about policy development processes generally, you know, policy making cycles and processes. Some of that includes voluntary sector ref re reflections as well. But there's hardly any scholarship or reflection about either policy relationships or development in opposition. How do oppositions develop policy and what does that mean? And in political science, there's not much reflection on opposition generally, um, opposition politics at all. The nearest that you can find is how oppositions try to show their credibility, how they try to enhance their credibility uh, in parliaments and with electorates, but not much in terms of policy formation and development. So I'm left with very little to go on here. However, one helpful frame has been the idea of policy neglect, which I'll just mention here just for if it, if it helps you understand where I'm coming from. So this comes from a piece of research, cross-national piece of research, I think it's 18 or 19 uh, countries across the globe, a couple of researchers trying to understand what's the relationship between uh, civil society and, and policies and governments effectively. What they were arguing is that there was a concern that populist governments were taking hold and in some places that was leading to repression uh, and the squeezing of the space for civil society and they were saying yes that is there but let's not overplay that because it may be that's not the most important thing going on it's happening quite seriously in some places but not always what they were arguing was more significant was this idea of policy neglect by which they mean a slow erosion and stagnation that characterizes state and non-profit sector relationships in terms of policy development. And this differs from active repressive policies. What they say is that while the non-profit sector civil society have grown economically and gained an importance in many regards, they've not received the policy attention that they deserve. So I thought that was kind of an interesting framing that might help understand uh, maybe the relationship with governments, but also potentially with opposition as well. Okay, let me talk a bit about the research that I undertook, methods, design, data, things like that. So I undertook a series of interviews in the second half of last year, mainly in the summer and autumn, a sample of key organisations and individuals who those people that would be likely to be involved in policy conversations in the sector, um, and with Labour and in think tanks, or they might be knowledgeable about the context in which the sector um, is operating. Uh, this was mainly on a sort of a national basis, so not really local stakeholders, uh, but it did embrace the four UK nations. So uh, I interviewed 41 people, uh, 43 people, 41 interviews. I'd sent out 50 invitations involving a total of 78 so individual people, and overall just three declined. Uh, there was no response from seven people uh, and one person I interviewed twice. So that's the final kind of group of interviews that I undertook. Mainly they were chief executives and policy leads for key sector bodies, infrastructure bodies, think tanks, some service delivery charities as well, uh, commentators about the sector, consultants, people like that but also what I've called here luminaries, by which I mean people that have been around a bit and maybe could shed light on how the current context compares to earlier contexts. So they can perhaps have a bit of their own personal reflection um, in there as well. Um, I gave people anonymity, so I'm not naming names, I'm not saying who I interviewed because uh, of the sensitivity of the topics we were covering, 
but I've given here a broad sort of word cloud of descriptive terms that give you an indication of the kinds of people uh, that I was interviewing, the kinds of organisations that I was um, interviewing as well. What I asked people to do was to read a briefing paper that I prepared, a 10, 11 page briefing paper that kind of set the context and why I was asking questions. And then I set sort of five possible hypotheses or explanations about what was going on now by way of the relationship between labour and civil society uh, and the voluntary sector. And I'll explain those five hypotheses in a second. And I was asking people to read the briefing in advance, uh, think about the hypotheses and think about, well, do you agree with them? Am I missed anything here? Is there anything that's just not in this picture at all? Um, what's your sense of what's going on? So it was a sort of a prompted conversation. By and large, people liked the, 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 the way that we approached it. I think the assumption was these are knowledgeable people. Let's have the conversation uh, uh, in direct terms about how they're engaging or not uh, with Labour, what they see around them. So the interviews were, were deliberately sort of sent to sort of provoke conversation around uh, five hypotheses. Um, here are the five hypotheses. I'll take you through them. This is going to be the busiest slide of the of the lecture, and I'll give you some reflection on um, how people responded to these kind of five um, hypotheses. They're not mutually exclusive. Uh, they do sort of overlap a little bit. Um, they're made up of sort of compound arguments. I was trying to simplify it. So at one stage, I had 14 of these different explanations. I thought it's too much to handle. Let's just collapse them into five. Uh, so they're broad brush type explanations. Um, and I was asking people, what do you make of these? Do they seem relevant, plausible? Um, do you disagree with any of them? Crucially, what's missing? And people did have lots of good suggestions around what was missing um, as well. So let me take you through them in turn and give you some reflections about what was going on. So remember my basic hunch is there's not much conversation or policy conversation under uh, d policy development underway. And I was testing the ground. Is that really uh, the case? So the first hypothesis is sort of a testing ground is that, well, maybe there is quite more going on. You know, maybe there's, you know, there's either not yet much happening or it's not really visible. It's not really much in public. So policy development is underway or will be happening, but you're not going to see it that much. It's a sensitive area. People don't talk about their political engagement. Uh, with political parties that much because it is contentious territory certainly maybe it's it has a lack of visibility because it takes place in the kind of policy silo areas criminal justice youth children's services health etc but not for the sector um overall so maybe this was uh, something that uh, it's going to gather pace there'll be more more than meets the eye and in fact that's what people thought was actually yes there is more going on than i was uh, uh, assuming you scratch the surface a bit people say yeah we are having conversations this is what's going on uh, generally though it's not easy was the uh, was the point that was being made so i've put more than meets the eye times three and there were three main things that seemed to be underway um, in the autumn they're still going on at the moment but three broad um, attempts at um, sort of influencing uh, labor's thinking one was around the development of a charity sector manifesto. This was work that was being led by NCVO and Akivo jointly. Um, uh, they were sort of consulting. You may have been involved in consultations or roundtables around what would be the main asks that we want we would want to make as the election comes near. This would be a cross-party manifesto because they, you know, they have to have sort of political impartiality. So it's for the election as a whole. What do we want from a future government, whoever it might be? So that was going on underway. There's more work going on around that, including round tables. This was part of work that um, is linked to a, a sort of a national grouping of uh, charities and infrastructure, what is called the Civil Society Group that meets regularly online. Uh, they've been trying to kind of work through how to kind of engage with the different political parties as well. So there's a little bit of work going on underway. A second strand of work, is organised mainly around social enterprise. Social Enterprise UK have brought together a sort of a, a coalition of interested people that want to promote social enterprise in the for a future government. Uh, this is called the Future Economy Alliance, um, and that brings together all groups of people that are thinking about what they're arguing is a new business plan for Britain, which has a, a key role for social enterprise cooperatives, uh, the social economy more broadly. 
And then the third one is, is perhaps more down towards the kind of community's agenda, the idea of community power, a coalition of grouping uh, of organisations and funders uh, around the, uh, coalescing around the idea of, of community power and the possibility of a community power act to try and devolve responsibility further. So you may have come across the We're Right Here campaign and some of the funders that support that um, as well. So there was more than meet the eye. There was there was there were bits going on. There's also things going on in these what I've called vertical channels: the policy development areas, uh, environment, children's services, uh, criminal justice, etc. Um, but there was a sense of rapid catching up going on, uh, both in Labour Party and in the sector. A sense in which we are trying to move very fast to try and have conversations, develop policy uh, uh, conversations and dialogue. So a bit of catching up going on there. The second hypothesis or explanation was this idea that there's not much going on because fundamentally, uh, you know, people are busy or they're distracted or they're just exhausted, um, particularly in the sector, that sense in which uh, working through multiple crises, uh, the pandemic following on after Brexit and the political turmoil of Brexit, pandemic, cost of living crisis, uh, th the sector is really hard pressed to be dealing with those kind of frontline uh, issues and therefore otherwise occupied, not really engaging in policy development at all. Uh, maybe it's just people are tired and burnt out as a result of this. Um, maybe their attention is needed elsewhere and this maybe affects the political parties as well. So maybe Labour's attention is elsewhere as well. It's otherwise occupied being an opposition. It's not thinking of policy development because it's mainly concerned at this time with attacking the government's record, its integrity, its competence, etc. And therefore, policy development takes a bit of a back burner. I think that's changing quite rapidly, but that was the sort of sense that, that may be an explanation for why there's not much um, engagement. People were kind of OK about this, but they're a bit lukewarm in some senses. They said, actually, if there was if there was time and space for policy engagement, if the doors were open, we would be there. So people would make time for it. But a bit of a mixed picture going on here, because people talked about, particularly within the voluntary sector, the broader issue of policy capacity. There just aren't the people able to do this work that there once were. Uh, one person with a bit of history in this sort of said, I remember being in, in an infrastructure organisation in policy. We had 12 people in our policy team. We were a large organisation. The equivalent now is one and a half. And so that, you know, the, the capacity is much lower than it once uh, was. Maybe, yes, the political focus is has been elsewhere. Uh, this is where the opposition is being an opposition and therefore the policy development bit comes a little bit later and maybe hence that catching up uh, that's going on uh, on both sides. The third hypothesis was the idea that maybe relationships between Labour and the sector have just become a bit more fragmented, a bit more tenuous, harder to sustain. There, there are two sides to this kind of argument I was, I was posing. One was whether within the voluntary sector, key organisations that had quite a bit of change of leadership, um, uh, people were new in post, so they hadn't really had the chance to sort of uh, build those kinds of relationships. But maybe also Labour had turned away a little bit from uh, the sector, particularly during the previous leadership, a sense in which uh, maybe under the Corbyn uh, leadership, there was less of an engagement with the sector, perhaps some suspicion of what the voluntary sector, what charities represented in terms of uh, political profile and ideology. The Trojan horse for neoliberalism was the argument that you might see from people uh, on the left associated uh, with the Corbyn leadership. Maybe there was a hangover from that and maybe that had continued, even though there was a new leadership uh, under Sakir Starmer. Uh, actually, this hypothesis was the one that people thought was least relevant and least plausible. Uh, they didn't have a great deal to say about it. They thought, well, yes, there is a sense in which the profile and interest of relevant politicians in the, in, who are, uh, um, have responsibility for civil society or the voluntary sector it does make a bit of a difference, and I'll show you why that might, that makes the case in a second. But they were harking back to the time when uh, the likes of Lisa Nandy and Steve Reid were the shadow civil society minister. A, they were very ambitious politicians. They had a much more pluralist outlook, and that had a greater role uh, in their thinking for the voluntary and community sector, civil society at large. They had experience of it, um, and maybe some of that had been lost um, in the in the latest incarnations 
uh, of civil society. Some antipathy in some labour traditions, a sense of which public sector first is really important, uh, a worry that uh, the sector, just because of the way commissioning sometimes works, uh, the way services sometimes work, whether that sort of undercuts union agreements and the like, notwithstanding uh, the campaigns around the real living wage. So some worry around some of those things as well. Um, some sense of voluntary sector turnover in terms of leadership, but not thought to be a, a major issue. The fourth and fifth hypotheses were slightly broader brush, and I was quite interested in these, whether there were bigger picture things going on. Uh, so the fourth one is this idea that maybe government's just not bothered about the voluntary sector anymore, and maybe that, that affects the opposition as well. Opposition is no longer bothered. So the governing class uh, within the state is no longer interested in the voluntary sector. It's no longer that important. Um, uh, maybe uh, politicians aren't coming up with big visions that involve the voluntary sector anymore. So no longer a third way or a big society. We don't hear so much of that kind of talk. People are a bit more sceptical and perhaps cynical about it. Um, so maybe, the, the you know, in a sense, the government had turned away from, from the sector, had that affected Labour. Some reflection positively about this hypothesis that, you know, it was negative generally. They were saying, uh, I think there is some relevance here. Particularly people were reflecting on their poor experience of working with the current government. Um, and there's a lot of talk about that and whether that then affects how Labour uh, uh, works with the sector as well. Um, some sense in which Labour's strategy um, involves a bit of mirroring the government, as it were. So mirroring the machinery of government. So as we know, um, the, the department now responsible for civil society is culture, media and sport. It used to be in the cabinet office. Some sense in which people think that that means it's marginalised or, or become marginalised in, in uh, policy terms. Uh, and Labour um, echoes that in its own uh, formation of its own uh, uh, shadow um, uh, shadow front bench. So, you know, it's part of the DCMS brief uh, as well. And maybe that's sl slightly more of a marginal position within there. But also mirroring some of the government's messaging, particularly the idea of trying to distance itself. Labour may be distancing itself from the voluntary sector, uh, saying, well, you know, uh, you're associated at the moment, at least in the, in the right wing media and amongst our target uh, um, uh, kind of coalition of voters as being rather woke. And therefore, we want to just keep away from that a little bit. So we want to open up some distance and maybe some anti woke messaging from Labour at the time was uh, was a sense in which maybe there's a bit of distancing going on. Uh, that's changed a bit in more recent uh, weeks, though, of course. So we'll see how that might play out as an interesting one. Labour strategy is very cautious, of course. Uh, absolute fear of replaying the lead into the 1992 election, where the Conservatives rather surprisingly and adeptly managed to position Labour as a high tax, uh, high taxing likely opposition and therefore government. Uh, and then uh, John Major won that election. A real worry that we're replaying that, ga uh, that game now amongst Labour uh, supporters. So a very cautious strategy. The metaphors in use are a Ming vase, small targets. We get rid of you know, difficult things, including today, possibly likely the 28 billion commitment uh, uh, for the Green Prosperity uh, Programme uh, plan, I should say. Uh, the idea of fiscal discipline being really uppermost and really small targeting of a small group of voters in so-called blue wall seats, the, he the hero voters, as they're called, that voted Conservative in 2019, trying to think, what are they interested in? It perhaps isn't the causes of the voluntary sector, maybe, so let's not talk about them that much. Um, so that's a kind of a general argument about where that might play. If you look at Labour's five missions, they don't say anything about civil society or the voluntary sector, really. They're on broader uh, uh, kind of cross-cutting um, uh, policy themes and ambitions. Uh, so an interesting which maybe the voluntary sector is just not important to Labour anymore is, is the thought that, that could be there. Some, some support for that kind of uh, hypothesis more broadly. The final one was the flip side of this, was the idea that maybe the voluntary sector has turned away from government and therefore turned away from engaging with Labour as a possible government. You know, government's no longer important to the sector. This may be because um, it, they've had such a burnt experience working with existing government. It could be they just don't believe government does, does anything very well anymore, doesn't have any money, doesn't really help, uh, gets in the way. So maybe a sense in which the sector has turned away 
is more interested in broader based social campaigns, working with the public at large, um, uh, broader based uh, um, social media campaigns, for example. Um, has it turned its back on, on uh, the policy process in that kind of way, a more of an outsider policy approach? There's a little bit of support for this, but not as much as I thought there would be. Uh, by and large, people saying, yeah, campaigning focus really remains for us in, in charities and in the sector. Yes, there is a lot more attention to broader publics um, and, uh, and social media, but actually there are mixed insider approaches going on as well. We are working with government, however difficult it is. We are trying to work with Labour, however difficult that might be. Some sense of some inward looking concerns for the sector as well. Uh, so maybe less attention on broader outward facing policy development or maybe policy development in a different way. So the concern within the sector about promoting and doing, uh, attending to concerns around um, equity, diversity and inclusion, for example, being a really important point for many organisations now. So some sense in which uh, 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 the sector is dealing with some of those aspects as well. OK, that's a broad approach to the kind of hypotheses that we we're talking about, some sense in what people were saying around that. I'll quickly move on because I'm worried about the, the time and I want to draw to step away from this now and try and think about the two main conclusions that I was drawing from all of these reflections. So is there a gap going on was my opening question and I want to return to that question. Is there a gap between pol in policy development with Labour at the moment? So the first side of this, I want to draw two main conclusions and the first side of this is about the kind of contextual factors going on, the differences between now and earlier periods and how material some of that might be. So four main differences from earlier times, certainly the current economic context uh, and likely public spending context was really thought to be uh, uppermost in people's minds. It really shapes the conversation, uh, a real sense that there's no money on the table. So that really does uh, affect the conversation. And that's particularly compared to the lead into the 97 election, less so the 2010 election, but certainly the 97 election. But similarities in the way some of these, the way some of these things are being framed, i.e. Labour taking a deliberately cautious, fiscally disciplined approach. There's no money. We're not going to be borrowing. We're not going to be raising taxes, um, et cetera. So don't expect too much by way of um, uh, uh, big investment. Sense of political volatility, particularly post-Brexit, populist policy making styles and politics, uh, a general sense that the policy making system and politics generally has become dysfunctional, um, civil service run ragged, opposition parties in a similar place as well. So we're in sort of almost abnormal policy making at the moment. It's not the usual general consultations, green papers and white papers. Um, social media campaigns seem to work quite well. Marcus Rashford being a, a case in point from a, a few years ago. Third one, probably most importantly, is the idea of compressed timescales. Uh, compared with previous times, um, there's been a rapid turnaround in the electoral prospects. So in 2019, the outlook really looked like with an 80 seat majority, the Conservatives will be in office for the next two terms of Parliament, maybe 10 years, a further 10 years. And many interviewees reflected that we were sort of that was where we were, that was where we were hedging our bets. So we were putting our efforts into talking to conservatives, and it's only latterly uh, that they're trying to catch up in terms of talking with Labour because the turnaround has been so rapid. The fourth point is about devolution and how that makes a difference, particularly compared to previous times. So much more complexity in terms of uh, the the way civil society is thought about different approaches. It's a devolved set of responsibilities across the four nations. It's a UK election, but with four different nation national contexts in play. And that matters quite a lot. Likewise, in terms of national and local dimensions, um, during the Conservative era, many uh, voluntary organisations were trying to work with what they saw as a sort of warmer spaces for positive development with local authorities um, compared to sort of national indifference. Uh, but potentially with local government now in such a meltdown, as we know, and that's likely to continue and get worse, uh, I think that really does change the nature of the conversation and changes the nature of the conversation about the sector with Labour as well. So it may be that the most important policy area, uh, given this fourth contextual area, is not to do with direct civil society and voluntary sector. It's to do with how you deal with devolution and how you deal with local governments. 
uh, is there going to be a new local government settlement? That's probably going to be more materially important for many in the voluntary sector, particularly locally. So is that the most important area? Second kind of conclusion is I think that there has been a relative marginalisation of the sector in the policymaking process. And I think there's two main interacting things going on, one, one in terms of politics and the other in terms of the sector. So in politics, you know, the dominance of the political field, particularly as the electoral cycle shifts, really does squeeze room for dialogue and changes the nature of the dialogue. Uh, with Labour at the moment, it's a cautious electoral strategy and economic framing. That's the way that they've been thinking about this. And lat it's only latterly that the programme for government is being really thought about. So the room for opening up for dialogue has been pretty small. This has been coupled with uh, the very cautious nature of the politicians on the front bench. Keir Starmer no notably sort of cautious, pragmatic, um, doesn't do vision stuff uh, very comfortably. Um, and that perhaps, uh, uh, you know, uh, constrains the space for uh, uh, conversation or has done. Maybe there's a waning interest across parties. The political conversation has moved elsewhere. People have been concerned about the pandemic, uh, economic crisis. They've been in emergency response mode. So perhaps not thinking more broadly. Um, one of my interviews kind of likened this to speed dating. Uh, so I'll just share this with you. Uh, they sort of said, well, this is a reflection of the government, really, but maybe it, it could be for Labour as well. They said, well, they used to date us occasionally, uh, but now, sadly, uh, well, they swipe left. Uh, now we're on the drunk dial. Like, you know, yeah, we haven't talked to you for four years, but but take us for granted. Can you organise 10,000 volunteers by the end of the week? So this sense in which politicians, the state maybe takes the sector for granted. Maybe Labour's doing the same. The second point here is on the sector. The loss of policy capacity really does matter. The main word that came up was we haven't got the bandwidth to engage in policy development such that we had before. We don't think Labour's got much bandwidth there either. Um, and attention is partly elsewhere. Um, concern a little bit from me about lack of coordination uh, around sector messages uh, and influencing. So maybe a bit of fragmentation. I mentioned three different approaches going on that I saw. There's not much dialogue between them, not much co-messaging or co-design of strategy going on. So that's an interesting set of fragmentations going on. So there was my kind of conclusion. Um, and then we've got the recent civil society summit from the last couple of weeks. So I just want to reflect on that very briefly, um, just to, to sort of close our conversation. The leader's office in the in the in Labour had been gathering, gaining some interest in engaging with the sector, a bit of entrepreneurial work by some people um, in the leader of the opposition's office, Lotto, um, about trying to engage with particularly the civil society groups. So there was like informal conversations going on, but it, that was ultimately based on champions within uh, the leader's office. The reshuffle in September has made a difference. So uh, the new civil society, shadow civil society minister, pictured at the bottom here, Lillian Greenwood, there's a sense in which she has been much more energetic and active and engaged uh, with the national uh, infrastructure bodies, the civil society group and others, uh, is perhaps taking more of an active interest. The civil society summit that was uh, a few weeks ago last month uh, was a really significant moment because you had, you know, the best part of a day, you had many shadow civil society front bench uh, people, speech from Keir Starmer, you may have seen it or tuned into it or seen the reports about it. Quite a significant statement for once, at least, a, a senior um, politician makes a statement um, around the sector. Um, and opening up words like, well, resetting the re relationship, a partnership for a mission-led government, the society of service that we talked about, and harnessing civil society as an engine uh, of renewal. So there's a sense in which these are sort of quite grand phrases being used, certainly for Keir Starmer, um, uh, given the, his general way of, uh, of, um, uh, of speaking. And uh, there's a, a question mark about where that goes. Uh, the sense is there's a commitment to, to build an action plan for a civil society working with Labour, particularly to do with the five missions. I think that's where the next space of conversation uh, will go. Raises questions for me, have we come full circle? Are we back to pre-1997, the idea of a partnership agenda, uh, but with a, a twist in the tail here, there's a sense in which there may not be much money about for this. It may be engagement with lack of investment. So how might that work 
Um, and some po rather positive messages there, uh, Keir Starmer leaning into sort of like w working around um, the culture war discussions and trying to defend the sector um, against some of the sort of conservative backbench in particular and conservative media um, attacks. Last point to make, where do we go next with this? Um, some sense, maybe it's election time, maybe there's lying low, biding time. Uh, there's a question about whether uh, actually we just wait. Uh, it'll be all right on the night, won't it? Labour will get in and everything will be OK, was was it some kind of sense. But others saying, hang on, that's really complacent, uh, given you know where we are now. It may not happen, even if you wanted it to happen. Uh, be careful what you wish for uh, as well, given given the nature of the, the way politics is working at the moment. So maybe there's a, a gradual rebuilding of relationships. Maybe it's more than gradual, given the pace that's needed, working through the missions for a programme for government. Uh, the, a Labour government will need the sector. And therefore, how does it play into that a little bit? Maybe there's work to do on coordinating sector efforts and messages concerned about fragmentation going on. Maybe there's a chance to play into some of the narratives that are going around at the moment in policy making uh, circles and discussions. Some of these aren't new particularly, but there's been talk by, you know, Starmer, West Streeting and others about reform. Maybe the sector has expertise in reform. It knows it has that grounded expertise about how things don't work on the ground and therefore how things could be organised uh, differently. So it could play into that maybe. There's narratives around community power and social infrastructure, maybe around the preventative uh, state as uh, depicted by Demos. And maybe there's a bit of new kind of politics going on. Labour Together, for example, a think tank that's uh, gained some prominence, has been talking about security in a broader sense, not just uh, military security, but the everyday security of households and insecurity. Is there a way that the sector could play into that narrative on an everyday basis? We help to enhance people's security in circumstances where they don't have it, for example. Um, and then there's the idea of respect and ordinary hope, which is coming more latterly as well. So there's a couple of kind of reports there that I'm, I'm alluding to some of these debates and possibilities. But I leave you with a final question. I just think society and the sector, we're in a big mess at the moment. Um, we've got an exhausted economic model. We've got broken public services. Nothing works. I'm being really pe pessimistic here, of course. We've got geopolitical tensions. Uh, we've got a climate emergency going on uh, right in front of us. So where are we heading as a society and where is civil society in that space? And what I want to know really is who's doing the more expansive, the more ambitious thinking about where civil society, where the voluntary sector might be able to contribute and lead us forward in some of these crises that we're working through. Uh, because politicians aren't doing those grand uh, thinking at the moment, to, to my thinking, they don't seem to be making those kind of grand ideas, uh, ambitious thoughts. So maybe the sector can step into that role. On that basis, I think I ought to stop, uh, Suzanne, and hope we can uh, have time for questions. I'll stop sharing on that basis, if that's okay.